Good morning. Welcome to St. John this morning on the fourth Sunday after Trinity. Remember, the uh, summer season is the season of growing, where we grow in both faith toward God and love for one another. And today you will hear a little bit of a contrast between, well, actually, a strong contrast between the ways of this world and even the kingdoms of this world, even this weekend as uh, our nation celebrates the anniversary of its founding, uh, but also then, of course, the contrast to the kingdom of heaven that is the kingdom of, of Christ's church and the gifts he gives here, which are quite different. So you hear that contrast. It wasn't intentional, but sometimes that's how the church year falls, right? So we get some coincidence that way. Let's begin with a hymn of invocation, Creator Spirit, by whose aid, hymn 500. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God,
Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. No war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent he will lift me high upon a rock. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, grant that the course of this world may be so peaceably ordered by your governance that your church may joyfully serve you in all godly quietness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the fourth Sunday after Trinity is from Genesis chapter 50. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So, do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. I give th you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. And they shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hand. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, 
and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. The Epistles from Romans, chapter 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. This is the word of the Lord. shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, Take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. When people first begin to take the Word of God seriously as catechumens, it's often the commandments that we pay special attention to first and foremost. Before, it didn't seem important to know what God said as long as you didn't get caught in the shame of the world. But now, as newborn children of God, they want to straighten out things with God. They know that they must be, as the psalmist says, both hearers and doers of the word. And so they put the Ten Commandments in their yard, little statues are on the courthouses, carved into the wall or in a painting. Maybe even memorize those Ten Commandments in their hearts. Of course, that's probably true for you who were catechized here. You may be not, unable to remember all the scriptures attached to absolution or baptism or the Lord's Supper, but I bet with some struggle you could recall all the commandments. And that's not a bad place to start. Jesus told the rich young ruler, we'll hear in a few weeks, who asked him what he must do to gain eternal life, Jesus said, keep the commandments. But then it happens repeatedly that people believe that, that from that moment forward, they have that possibility, that agency to become better. It will be easier now that they know the commandments to live a good Christian life. All they need to do is follow the rules better. And in the greatest deceit, some believe that they are successful and can say to themselves, as Paul said about it when he was a Pharisee, that they are, as regards righteousness under the law, blameless. But the scriptures say that we do not understand ourselves rightly. We do not hear the law lawfully. We mis the mistake is that we compare ourselves to others so that we can excuse our own lawlessness. Perhaps we can properly say that we're not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, politicians, and lawyers. It seems necessary to judge other people. How else are we going to be found righteous? It could just be they could be just as good as we are, of course, if they wanted to. But it's pr precisely because we judge others that Jesus says today that we ourselves are judged. This shows that we have not taken the law of God seriously. We have not heard the law lawfully. We have arbitrarily chosen what we will use as our standard, but have lost the most important thing. Just as the Pharisees well, they kept the law, they thought, with the tithe of mint and dill and cumin, but neglected, Jesus says, the weightier things, justice, mercy, and faithfulness, Matthew 7 and Luke 6. Therefore, Jesus today reminds us that it is he who judges others, and those who do so, who judge others instead of him, will themselves be judged. The Christian should not, of his own accord, judge others. Still, there are those who sit in office with particular God-given authority, be it the president, the mayor, the councilman, the judge, the house father, the school teacher, the preacher. They're all given to judge, to punish, and to pass sentence, not of themselves, not because everyone has that authority, but rather by their office, Romans 13. It would be hardly fitting for a subject to say to his superior, a child to his father, or a pupil to his school teacher, or a thief to the executioner, you remember what Jesus said, be merciful, judge not, condemn not, etc. So that's not what Jesus is talking about. Those offices were given by God, offices of law to exercise the law. If an authority, ruler, judge, or house father were to practice pure mercy and not be serious about administering punishment, the world would be full of wicked villains in no time. No one would be safe. Moreover, same for the preacher who has 
the office of judge. If a preacher should hold his peace regarding false doctrine, lies, error, iniquity, and vice, individual Christians and the congregation's faith would be attacked constantly and maybe even undermined. Christ says the word is what judges them. And so Jesus judges by his word, John 12. Ah, but you say, I can hear you. What about those times when the one given to be judged by God fails to do the job? What about, I don't know, the Department of Justice acting unjustly? What about when their judgment is faulty or wrong? When, what about when they make the wrong verdict? Can't I just step in and voice my opinion and take over for them? Well, that's nothing new, to have an opinion of others. It's our sinful nature, after all. But we are given to keep our mouths shut if we have no authority to judge. But of course now, today, this is the preferred method to rule in our time. Not under authority given, but rather to, well, be judged in the court of public opinion. We the people are manipulated, controlled, cajoled, and indoctrinated by all of our media, broadcast, social, and otherwise, to judge others. Everything is about having your opinion and telling the world, judging. We are the court of public opinion, which must be won if you're going to win most criminal cases. It has much bearing on what the courts decide. Those judges are swayed by what you think they should do, regardless of the actual evidence in the case or what is truly right and just. And worse yet, we take matters into our own hands then with vigilante justice. You say, I'm not Batman. Well, no. But do you defame, libel, slander, and destroy others' reputation? The reputation of your neighbors? Judging them? All the while thinking it is just and right to do so? Again, what's often missing, and what's helpful this weekend as our nation celebrates its founding, is the distinction between the person and the office. Distinction between what is given to each individual person and what is specifically given to the offices established by God. That has to be sharply distinguished. Jesus said today, individuals are prohibited from judging and sentencing. But for those who occupy the office, judging, sentencing, and punishing are permitted. And yes, they make mistakes. It's not always done, well, even in a godly way, never mind in a just way. So when Christ says, judge not, condemn not, he's talking about you, not the judges and the magistrates, the president, the Congress, Department of Justice, and all of its agencies, FBI, CIA, whatever. He's talking about you, judge not, condemn not. And what he's then specifically getting after is gossips, slanderers, those who bear planks and judge splinters, who pass sentence on others without authority and do so out of malice, hatred, and wicked intent. They speak, but they have no authority to do anything about it. So they complain and whine about others and fail to actually take responsibility for themselves. I wish that person would die or have this or that punishment, they say. I'd like to see them do the perp walk. I'd like to see them thrown into prison. What is this if not usurping judgment from God and the authorities he's established? Indeed, sinning against both the law of nature and God's own revealed law and condemning oneself in the process. For if you hate your brother, you are a murderer, Jesus says, according to John, and repeated then by John, the apostle, 1 John. And much more is he who judges, sentence, and condemns his brother a murderer when such things are not committed by right to him in his office. So, according to Jesus today, he who takes the commandments seriously will cease comparing himself to others. The law demands instead that we compare ourselves with God. We ought to be perfect as he is perfect, merciful as he is merciful, holy as he is holy. That's the law heard lawfully. And the law then does not allow us to be satisfied with ourselves. It always accuses. 
The knowledge of sin comes to us through that law. And thus our mouth is stopped, and we all stand guilty before God. Honest and earnest law keepers of Jesus' day saw the same. Remember I mentioned that rich young ruler. He knew that something was lacking in him or he wouldn't have come to Jesus in the first place. Even though he had done all that could be asked of him as a good man, at least in the eyes of the world. And it was the elders among the Jews who stole away first, who ran away disturbed in their conscience by what Jesus said. That he who was without sin among them should cast the first stone at that woman caught in adultery. He who was without sin should cast the first stone. But they all fled, disturbed. If the law of God or the commandments have helped us to see that we do not live up to the standards that God has established, and we have then no right to judge others, well, then they can further aid us in, the matter, in a matter that's even more important. Standing accused, judged by God, is not the proper work of God's word or of his congregation and his preachers. God's law, as Paul says in Galatians 3, is to be a tutor to Christ. A tutor to Christ, Galatians 3. That is, the law can begin to teach us to listen seriously to God's proper work, the better word, the good news, the gospel. He who allows for whatever compelling reason God has to judge him will then begin to listen anew to the Savior who does not judge, who forgives. Not because Jesus needs forgiveness and not because he has no occasion to judge, but because he has already taken upon himself your destiny, your sin, and has died in your place. The judgment rendered. That's what we fail to understand and believe. Why aren't we to judge others? Not because they don't need judgment, but because we are not the final judge. That's God the Father. And he has already exacted that judgment upon his son, Jesus, in our place and also in our neighbor's place. Why judge your neighbor if Jesus has already judged him forgiven? The cross of Christ is the final judgment for sin, even for, for the most wicked transgressor, the most unjust. Those who refuse to hear the judgment of God's word, the Spirit's working repentance and faith, and the forgiveness of sins for their planks or specks in their eyes, well, they will be offended by Jesus and they will stumble across him but for you who have heard, been repented, and believe the verdict of sins forgiven in Christ, you are judged not guilty, saved eternally. What good news. And what better news could you actually give to your neighbor? Not gossip, slander, libel, judging them, either to their face or to others, but rather, what could you possibly want more for your fellow neighbor than to be a Christian? that one who you formerly were so quick to de destroy, now to forgive them in the name of Jesus, with good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over into their bosom. That's what the work of the church is all about, and that's what distinguishes us from all civil authority, whose only job is to judge. Here, you are judged not guilty always and forever in the forgiveness of Jesus. May God work repentance in your hearts, and give you to live in this forgiveness. And in turn, then, love and serve your neighbor with Christ's forgiveness too. In Jesus' name. Amen. We confess our common Christian faith and show love for one another by confessing together the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, 
who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole Church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, keep us from self-idolatry that seeks to avenge ourselves on our enemies by repaying evil with evil. Help us instead to overcome evil with good and live peaceably with all. Lord, in your mercy. As your mercy is poured out in rich measure, so open the mouths of all ministers in the church to pre preach your blessed and saving gospel. Open the mouths of Christians to proclaim the marvels of him who called us from darkness into his marvelous light. Let our works of mercy attest to the love we have received from you. Lord, in your mercy. Teach all your children true humility that we would learn to confess our sin rather than excuse or deny it. Keep us safe from all pride, which would lead us to disdain our fellow Christians who have received your mercy. Lead us rather to rejoice at, your, at the patience you have shown each of us in forgiving our many trespasses. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of all, you raised up Joseph according to the, your plan to exercise authority in Egypt working good from what was meant only for evil. On this holiday weekend, we ask you to work by your power in the leaders and authorities of our nation, whom you have set in place, that many would be kept alive and protected in this life through their governance. Lord, in your mercy. Sustain all who suffer in body or mind. We especially remember those who have requested our prayers, Dale and Pam, Joe, Melanie, Kelsey, Christopher, Marcy, Brad, Gus, Eileen, Ron, Doug, Bev, Joan, Pat, Wendell, and Darlene. Let them believe firmly that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy compare to compare with the glory to be revealed at Christ's return. Grant them health and healing according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. We have much to celebrate, O Lord, and we celebrate with you, especially those whom you have given ongoing life celebrating their birthdays. Graydon, Abigail, Gracie, Jackie, Chelsea, and Jason. Those rejoicing in the gift of new birth in their baptism, Crystal, Joshua, Walt, and Jacob. We give thanks to you for the healing you have given to Barb. We ask your blessing upon all our households, especially that of Martin and Tara, Paul, Courtney, Doug, Jim and Deborah, and Robert. We intercede on behalf of Dasha, looking for new housing, and for Matt's mom, Donna, who's being treated for a stroke. Lord, in your mercy. Clear away all grudges, unbelief and impenitence from us, that we may eat and drink your son's body and blood with lively faith in his promises and receive the forgiveness you give in this blessed sacrament. Lord, in your mercy. 
Finally, Lord God, Heavenly Father, we know that you are merciful and through Christ have promised that you will neither judge nor condemn us, but graciously forgive all our sins and abundantly provide for all our wants of body and soul. By your Holy Spirit, establish in our hearts a confident faith in your mercy. Teach us in turn to be merciful to our neighbor, that we may not judge or condemn others, but willingly forgive all and, judging only ourselves, lead blessed lives in your fear. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to greet one another with the reconciliation we have in Christ, with his peace. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through who Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection Open to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, 
evermore praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, 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 God in the highest. Blessed is he who, who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, God in the Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Lamb of God, you take us.
We stand? The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Let's sing the last distribution hymn as our post-communion canticle today. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.